All right, welcome back, Science 7. Today we are getting into our last, last um, chapter of Unit B, Plants for Food and Fiber. As you may notice, <clears throat> we have learned about several different parts of it. For instance, we're starting with our angiosperm and gymnosperm structures, that's a flowers and how each of the system, root system, shoot system, those kind of guys work. And at the same time, we learn about adaptation, a little bit of a photosynthesis, which also from Bill Nye, video analysis too. And at the same time, we learn about soil and how human impacts can affect soil. So abiotic factors are what we were focusing on. Chapter four is talking about, we are basically modifying environment. And when I say modifying environment, you got it right. It's no longer a natural environment. We are going to talk about artificial environment. How can we increase the number of crops so that we can support all of the population that we have uh, over the world? And as you may notice, the world population is increasing. As you may notice, these are the ones that we're going to focus. And some of them are quite debatable because we're going to talk about genetic engineering. And yes, it is against uh, Christianity, especially when it comes to ethics and religion. And I understand, and I understand about that problem too. However, this is part of the curriculum. It is what's happening in the world. We're not going to talk about whether it's a good thing or not, even though we may debate about it. But we are going to focus on what's happening as a fact-wise. First thing first, yields. Of course, I'm not talking about the stop sign, yield sign in traffic. I am talking about in terms of agriculture. I actually mention about this quite a lot, especially when we talk about our chemical fertilizer, organic fertilizer, and what kind of fertilizer will you choose for what? It was more about debate. Yield is technically a, a terminology that is used in science to determine the amount of useful parts of the plant so if we're talking about corn then we're talking about corn only technically kernel if it's apple tree we're talking about apple edible part those kind of things strawberry you got the idea so we're not talking about the roots and so on even though some plants Roots are significant, but when it comes to corn, we don't eat roots, right? Why do we need to think about this yield? Well, every day, and this is all statistic, we have more and more, in fact, and a highlight instead. We have more and more human population. Um, increase in human population every single day, every single year. It's actually exponential growth, ladies and gentlemen. Naturally, in order to support our population, we need food. And why plant plays such a huge role is because we learn about this food pyramid and energy pyramid. When it comes to at the bottom, which is this layer over here or tier, you need to understand that at the bottom is where we have producers. Producers are plants. And if you're talking about the crops, they are under the categories of producers. And producer have or can provide most amount of energy. To human, to in fact, to all of the animal. This has led technological and systematic development to increase the yield of plant. Please look at this table, I mean, sorry, graph over here. As you may notice, every single part of agriculture business, you may notice that fruits 
vegetable, cereals, or any type of um, crop that you can think of, even though there's green over here, they are increasing not as linear, but exponentially, especially when it comes to cereal two average, you will notice that it's curved. It's more directly observable when you look at fruit situation. Now, exponential growth, ladies and gentlemen, like I mentioned, is if you have x and y axis in a graph, you are increasing small amount at the first, but in the end, the difference between previous year to the current year are getting more and more. It's more distant further and further. This is what I like to call exponential growth. It's the exact same as population growth, which no wonder. We need to have exponential growth for crops so that we can support human. And we also eat pork, beef, chicken. Those animals, they also need crops. So no wonder why we are overproducing. The only problem is, do we have enough of space and resource? So, ladies and gentlemen, please pause this video so that you can come up with at least one strategy. It can be traditional or technological strategy so that humanity can increase the yield of crop. How we can increase the useful part of every single grain, fruit, those kind of things. I want you to pause this video, write it, and with the substitute teacher's assistant, discuss about it, share your answer. Once that's done, let's go with artificial environment. The very first thing that I like to talk about is the greenhouse. Some people have it at the backyard of theirs. Uh, greenhouse is one of the perfect condition creator because inside of the greenhouse, you can control abiotic factor. So for example, temperatures, space, nutrients, light, and water, those type of abiotic factors are controlled in a perfect amount. So these can be provided so that it's ideal condition for plants. And the thing is, as you can see from this, even though this was an animation, look at the size of the watermelon over here. As you may notice, Gromit, which is a character over here, are he is actually comparing some of those uh, big, big fruit or vegetable size. In his case, he raised really big watermelon. And as you may see, it ended up getting really, really maximum distance or length in this case, because that is his maximum yield for this plant. When it comes to tomatoes, not much. As you may see, it's a regular size over here. But in any case, in order to have a big yield, big juicy fruit and vegetable, you got to control the abiotic factor. Another thing, we use something called hydroponic system. Hydroponic system is, as you may notice, it is, if you call artificial soil slash growing environment. In fact, most of these barrels or cylinders, they don't even have soil. So I'm going to introduce what things are in there. But once we control the pH level, which is acidic, alkaline, or basic, or saline, salt condition even, then you are creating a small ecosystem or environment that works best for these guys. And some schools actually have it. First thing first, they have some kind of growing medium. And that medium can be, like I mentioned, some of them have water 
Some of them have a little gravel with water. So it's different mixtures. But I found that most of the situation, they have water. We don't even use soil. Now I'm going to show the cross section shortly after. Nutrient rich solution. And obviously, when it comes to nutrient rich solution, a big thing that I want to point out is they have, so these guys have high in mineral. And remember, mineral can be dissolved in water. Also have rich in oxygen. You don't need to worry about algal bloom or anything, even if you're talking about the water plant. Water, duh, because it's a medium. Fresh water is more what I like to say. And when it comes to this water, I like to also put the uh, ideal pH condition. So that's a fancy way of saying it's around 7 or depends on some plants that really likes acidic situation. Acidic environment and basic environment, you can actually control using the solutions and water. This system fosters rapid growth really fast. Don't even take more than days or weeks, to be honest, if it's extreme like lettuce and stronger yields and superior quality. In fact, a lot of um, vegetables, as you may notice, you can also fold them. So the more going up, less going sideways. So that's why you can have hundreds of these inside of a big, big um, greenhouse so that you can use uh, more spaces. Think about this as a buildings of plants. And this is a side section view, ladies and gentlemen. As you may notice, some have a little angle like the one that you see over here because gravity will make the water go down and go down and that we are recycling them like a river. Or some of them have a stationary position with a little bit of air stone that provided fresh enough of air, including oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's OK. It's actually giving the pores in a good condition. And when it comes to nutrient solution or pumped up and then spray, this is the one that I mentioned, a little bit of a gravel and water mixture. Some of them undergo drip system. Drip system work really well to certain plants that like stress, such as grapes, actually. But not all the time. And some of them have a mist, which is using like an aerosol, like a spray. So I want you to understand that there are several different types. And when it comes to hydroponic system, plants are grown in a gravel or sand, like the one that I mentioned, and nutrient-rich water is then pumped through. The water hoses to provide the plants with everything it needs to grow. And when it comes to everything needs, Although this is a little bit of extreme situation, photosynthesis play a huge role. H2O, minerals, organic materials, etc., etc. Especially water play a huge role for photosynthesis. Stuff. And variety of the variety of plants actually require variety of conditions. But when we talk about variety, you need to understand that now we're talking about genetics and genetic engineering, just in case, and it's a little bit of spoiler alert. Not every plants are identical. You can actually find a bunch of variety of same type of vegetable and fruit. But just because they're genetically slightly different, they may require different environment. So for example, uh, I want you to think about this question. How many different types of apples can you buy at the grocery store? Now pause this video with the substitute teacher's guidance. I want you to throw some of the example, what type of apples you see. And substitute teacher, please write some of the example on the board. Once everything is finished, here are some examples. Look at all of these apples, ladies and gentlemen. Distinctively, we have different colors. 
and different size, different shapes. Even among red, we have Gala, which is one of my favorite, Fuji, Macintosh, those kind of guys. And some of them have more sweetness, more sourness, those kind of things. And when it comes to green, which is generally more sour, Granny Smith, yellow, or sometimes golden, we have ginger gold, those kind of different type of varieties are available. And because they are from different, how can I say, environment, they evolve slightly differently. You can think it in that way too. Some area, they may have less water. Then the plants will have more stress. But the thing is, some plants with a little bit of stress, they can give it more crisp and juicy, uh, sweet fruits inside. Or some of them can be more sour. Another example that I can tell you is wild mustard plant. When it comes to its variety of form, it, this is one of the most important evolutionary track in botany. As you may notice, in the same family, it actually has such a variety. Some of them work, uh, some of them evolve to into kale for the, I'm just going to use a highlighter. The leaf section can be planted separately and create kale situation. Broccoli. Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower. As you may notice, these are the variety. These are the one that you can actually modify just parts by parts. And then you can use, for example, stampar or kohirabi. I know this plant, but I never actually taste it. And as you can see, we have a stem part that is embedded and grow or leaf part. You can actually modify it and grow it as a kale, broccoli, stems also, leaf buds or Brussels sprout. We have a lot of variety, even from one single plant, wild mustard plant. So how that happened? Well, that's where the evolution comes in and different types of genetic material. Let's put a pause button for today's lesson. I will provide you a homework question shortly.